I'll make a comment. I was on Maui this week teaching at the YWAM base. And uh, in the process of doing, came across this flyer, which was inside the hotel book. And so that they had me in a little motel room, and they always had the little book, what's going on in the neighborhood, where you can find a restaurant, and this and that and so forth. And this flyer was in there. Now, as we have been studying, we've been studying in, the, in this book that one of the key things that uh, Titus has been challenged to challenge his congregation on is that we need to live lives of consistency. Amen? That we need to be people of the word. We need to say, even in our inconsistency, when we blow it, when we fall, to say, you know what? I blew it. I stumbled. Forgive me. Because we're not perfect, but we can be perfectly dedicated, perfectly committed to saying, yes, Lord, your word, your will, and your way. Well, the reason why I bring that up is he says, even in the, as we looked at the passage last week, that we have to live our lives in the glory of God that we might silence those who want to shame us, who want to criticize. Here in this flyer, in this hotel room, it's called Core Transformation. Check this guy's name. Gur Lyons. Gur. You've got to be a guru with a name like Gur. Core Transformation with Gur Lyons. Now listen, Celtic Seer... Gur Lyons is a powerfully clear-channeled for sacred energy. He is a unique wise man, a healer, a modern-day alchemist. Notice, a man who walks his talk. If that's not a subtle slam upon Christianity, folks, you missed it. You see, it's been the hypocrisy, the inconsistency of the body of Christ saying one thing and living another that has allowed the enemy such inroads in so many areas that people who are sitting in a hotel room are not going, hey, where's a cool church that I can go to? You who are visiting here this week, wonderful. I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad your heart said, hey, where's a church that I might have fellowship with and we love you and welcome to be a part of us today. But here, this flyer is saying, hey, this guy, Gur Lyons, he walks his talk. Interesting how it goes forth. Journey into the heart of your life. Experience the power you have to transform your life into a dynamic, vibrant existence. Carried by the endless power of love. Discover the limitless possibilities that lie within you right now. Now here's where I have a response to Gur. Gur, if you have this powerful truth of love, why does it cost $159 a ceremony? No one's even passed a plate in front of you today and they won't. Because all giving is done is done by those who this is the family that God has called them to be and we participate and we celebrate together. Amen? Amen. This week I got a letter from a person who watched our episode on how to share your faith on Kahlo. They watched the episode, were emboldened, went to their friend who had cancer, shared with them that person gave their life to the Lord and 10 days later they died. They're in the kingdom of God because of what you are participating in. Amen? You see, that's what the family of God can do corporately together. And so my point is, listen, the call is real. We need to pay attention to His Word. We need to ask for God power transformation so that we can start living and sharing the truth to set people free. Amen? Amen. All right. Father, thank You now for this morning. Help us in this place to become more like You so we can lead more people to You. Lord, we know that we stumble and fall. This is not the fellowship of the perfect, but the progressing. We're growing in Your grace and Your light and Your truth. So transform us now. Lord, may I decrease and you increase in us. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock, our redeemer, our Abba Father. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Last week, as we ended off in the passage here in chapter 2, the main theme of the whole message, if you recall, was the importance of one generation pouring into another. Remember? That we are called to be a generation that the older men pour into the younger men. The older ladies pour into the younger ladies. And as I said, we need to be doing that in our marriages. We need to be doing that relationally. We need to be about what God calls discipleship. And it doesn't matter. It's not even in age. In other words, I have discipled people who are older than me chronologically, but younger than me in the Lord. And so there is a concept of not only wisdom in the age, but also insight in the word. And it's important that we recognize that's a calling that God has given to us. But as I was sharing with you last week, and I did not have the time, but I will bring it in this morning, because we have predominantly ignored that, go and make disciples, not go and hang with disciples, not go and find a fully functional, excited discipleship church. It says, go and make disciples. And because we have ignored predominantly that call, that commandment of God, and for the most reason, because most of us were not discipled, 
because of the mass evangelism movement topical style that happened through the 70s and the 80s, we shifted from each one reach one to these mass movements. And so in this mass movement of people getting responding to Christ, they were not discipled. Everything became distant and passive rather than as the navigators and other great ministries said, each one discipling one and helping people grow and mature in the word of God. What has happened is you weren't discipled. So when you hear about discipleship, you agree with the principle, but you don't know what they're talking about or where would I start or how would I end? What is it all about? So then we're not doing it. And so here's the thing. It has rendered the church predominantly impotent. And let me make my point. There's definitely more than 250 of you in this room this morning. What if just 250 of us in this room believed God's call, God's commandment, and prayed? Now, God loves to answer a righteous prayer. Amen? So what if we pray, literally said, Lord, in the month of July, give me one person who will respond to the gospel. One person who will resp respond to Jesus Christ and the need for him to be their Lord and Savior. And let me disciple just that one person. Now, of course, that means you're going to have to share with many because it might be that one that you've been saying, sharing forever. And they're not yet responding. That's okay. Share with more than one. A sower went out to sow. Let's cast our seed and see where the soil is, where God will bring forth fruit. Amen. Now, if we do that, if each one of us of the 250 reach one person and disciple them, at the end of the first month, July, we will have what? 500. There will be 500 walking discipled Christians. Now, if these walking discipled Christians, as we're discipling them along, say, now, brother, as God has done with you, you've got to have friends who need to know what you know. Oh, yeah, I do, I do. And so you begin to teach them, as I taught you, how to share the faith and how to evangelize. And so they go and they say, God, give me just one person this month, just one person that I might lead to salvation. And in that work, notice overhead what happens. In that second month, there are now a thousand walking discipled Christians. Each of those thousand Pray that same prayer. In the third month, 2,000. Now follow me. In the fourth month, 4,000. Fifth month, 8,000. In the sixth month, 16,000. In the seventh month, 32,000. In the eighth month, 64,000 walking discipled Christians. The ninth, 128,000. In the tenth, 256,000. In the eleventh, 512,000. You ready? And in one year, in the 12th month, 1,024,000 discipled Christians. That's the population of Oahu. <laughs> if we just do what God has simply asked us to do. Amazing. And here's a really scary thought because like I said, Papa Kale, I couldn't go past that last one. But what if that 1 million one, then it doubled? And just kept going and kept going and kept going. Is this possible, church? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Each one reach one. You see, there's a point in time where we have to say, okay, Titus, Timothy, Paul, we get it. We hear you. You followed what Jesus was commanding you to do. We see the fruit. You turned the world upside right. You were living in a pagan world where there was deities and gods and sacrifices and sexual rituals going on all around you. And we're trying to say, oh, Waikiki is so sinful. And yet, Lord, in that pagan culture, you transformed it because they believed what you were teaching us this morning. Hey, I've got a thought. How about not only the each one reach one, but how about as we begin to shout out to the television channels and through the television channel and through the churches, hey, why don't we get a national prayer line going right here in Hawaii? And that you folks can say, hey, my family will take a two-hour slot. And from 9 to 10, we can have it actually switched to your home. And you and your husband sit there in your living room and you pray over people who call in. Let's start evangelizing. Let's start being significant and not be looking about success. Amen? And that's this pastor's heart. One last thing in verse 9 of Titus chapter 2 where we finished off last week. He challenged us as bond, slurves, uh, bond servants, bond slaves to be this. He says, be subject to their own masters and everything. Notice our list. Be well-pleasing. Not argumentative. How'd we do this week? Not pilfering. Hopefully nobody took anything they're not supposed to. But showing all good faith that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. Wow. That was a call to me this week as I studied this with you last week. Lord, help me to live my life that people would see it as a cloak upon me and that they would desire to adorn themselves with the gospel of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, today we pick up at verse 11. So join me, if you would, Titus chapter 2, 
verse 11, and let's draw this passage to its end. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Now, let's just stop right there. What I love about the Bible, and you've heard me say this so many times, is the Bible doesn't tell us just what to do, like your typical religious book or holy code might be. They might say, you must do this. You must, in order to have, you know, inner peace, you must be able to do this and da 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 and all these. The Bible doesn't tell me just what to do. The Bible tells me how. Amen? But what I love about that is God doesn't tell me just what to do. It tells me how and why. So how and why should I share my life with the next generation? Okay, pastor, you just got me. I hear that. The discipleship model, awesome. But how can I do that? And why should I do that? The answer is right here. Paul takes them there in verse 11. It says, the grace of God has appeared. What is the grace of God? Jesus. Let's try that again. What is the grace of God? Jesus. All right. Jesus! Somebody said it right. Jesus! All right, now, here we go. Jesus, the grace of God has appeared. In other words, God has spoken about His love, but then now He came and He manifested, and Jesus Christ has come to show us. Listen, if all Christianity was only about you and I getting saved, we would know nothing else about Jesus' life. All we would know is that He came, died on the cross, and if you put your faith in Him, and then when we got saved, boop, we'd be out of here. But the grace of God has appeared. And you see, I begin to know why I can share with people. I love the fact that the Bible even begins to reference Jesus, not just in His name, but by what He did and who He was. Jesus, the grace of God, and what does it say? Has brought salvation to all men. Jesus came and He brought salvation to whom? Okay, now here's the question. Are we really going to believe that? To all men. To all men. You see, when you see something going on in the news and someone does a violent crime, do we sit there in the paper and go, Oh Lord, you better just give them theirs. Or, Oh, they're going to get theirs. Or, do we do like my buddy did in Northern California when there was a brutal murder of an 18-year-old that killed another 18-year-old with a baseball bat? And Steve, a youth pastor at the time, was so moved by what he read that he goes down to the prison, asks to see the guy. The guy comes out and he goes, Who are you? He goes, my name is Steve, and I'm your friend. He goes, I don't know you. And he goes, well, I just said, my name is Steve, and I'm probably your only friend. (laughs) And through that, he led that man to the Lord, walked with him the 20 years that he was in prison. Now that he's out, he's on staff at that church organizing prison ministries. You see, the salvation is to how many men? All. All men. There is nobody beyond salvation, including you, dear one, including you. No one is beyond what God wants to do. Now, what else has Jesus done? Look at verse 12. He's not only come, He's not only brought salvation and grace and glory, He has now done this, instructing us. I encourage you to underline that. Instructing us. And when God says that He's instructing, we ought to pay attention. What is He instructing us? First, to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. Now, we've been talking about that quite a bit, so we don't need to go into that. But just notice the point is, it's a choice, is it not? It's deny. When you are channel surfing, you have the power. I got the power. (laughs) And it's right there in your thumb. You see nonsense, keep clicking. (laughs) And even better, the top right-hand one that's red, click. It's a great book. The author is a good friend of mine. You'll love it. (laughs) Amazing things happen when we deny, first of all, deny ungodliness and world desires. In other words, don't feed the flesh. Number two, to live sensibly. Now, this is where we've got to have a little fun because we've been taking so long as we've been studying this beautiful text that we have not realized that this is the fourth time in only the second chapter that he's used the word sensibly or sense. Live your lives in a way that is sensibly or one that is making sense. You see, the question is that, that Paul was addressing was that there was a lot of crazy things going on back then too. And so I'm going to ask you this morning this question. Does your life this day, this day, does it make sense? Does your life make sense? Well, if it doesn't, is it perhaps because you've not been doing what God says and that is live sensibly? The two go together. The Bible says, deny ungodliness, 
worldly desires and live sensibly. You see, are you living sensibly? It goes on to say, and righteously and godly in this present age. You see, here's the choice. Worldly desires, kapokahi life. Crazy. I call it the my way highway and it's nothing but crash and burn. And so many of you were taught Sunday school. You were on a stage one time yourself in vacation Bible school going, get down, he lifts me up, I get down. You were singing all these things. And all of a sudden junior high hit. And this demonic attack called puberty. <laughs> Just kidding. But all of a sudden it was, who's she? Who's he? Hey, I'm tall. I'm short. Wait, how come I look different than they do? <laughs> and all of a sudden the most difficult class became lunch. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. What am I going to be? A rock, a bop, a jock, a knot? What am I, you know? What am I going to be? And so lunch became the difficult subject of the day. How am I going to fit in and all these things? And all of a sudden we started looking at the world rather than looking at the author of the world. And it began to start influencing us. And so we began to challenge the teachings of the Word of God. And you walked away and you started living things for self. And you found yourselves 18, 19, and 20 in places that at 9, 10, 11 you swore you'd never be. It's like the old frog in the beaker. Remember? Some of you did not have that experiment because they were doing animal things, protections, when you grew up. But we could torture animals when I was in science class. <laughs> and the experiment was to show the incredible adaptability of the frog. And so you took the frog and you put him in lukewarm water, he just sat there fine. You put him in warm water and he jumped right out. Then you had to chase him, it was kind of fun, scare the girls and all that. Then we put him back in the lukewarm beaker and put that in the ring over the Bunsen burner. And very slowly, on a very slow, over the half hour lab, you watch that water go warmer, warmer, past the water that he jumped out in, to the point where it boiled and he died in water he could have jumped out in any moment. But because the transition was so slow, he died. And you today, what's the temperature of your water? What is your thermometer? Satan knows he's not going to get you from A to K, but A to B and... B to C, hey, I might as well D, I'm here. And on we go. And that's what happened to that little frog in the beaker. Does your life make sense? Are you living godly? As it says there in the scriptures, it says righteously and godly in this present age. Now, I have a fun insight for you. The key, eyes this way please, the key to any sport, if you've played any sport, the key that they constantly give you is to keep your eye on, keep your eye on the ball. Okay? <laughs> Keep your eye on the ball. I don't know who that is, but that's a scary look. <laughs> you see, how do you achieve what we are to achieve? By looking at what we're not supposed to do? If you grew up in that Christianity, stop. I've got transformation for you today. I am not talking about you looking going, ooh, bad, radar, no, no. I'm saying, whatever is pure, whatever is honor, whatever is lovely, focus your mind on these things. You see, when you're living hard for God, you ain't got time for the compromise. Because we're living sensibly, lives that make sense. You see, we need to keep our eyes. Paul says, hey, you know how you live a righteous life? How you live a godly life? Simple. Verse 13. Get your pencils ready. This is how we live godly lives, righteous lives, sensible lives. Paul says not just what to do, but how to do it. Here it is. Looking for, meaning keeping your eyes on the ball. Looking for, what does it say? You tell me. The blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Isn't that awesome? First of all, I want to encourage you to underline blessed hope and then our great God. He's not just a good God. He's not just a God. He's a great God. And he said, he says, this is how... We live our lives that make sense, righteous and godly. Eyes this way, please, for a second, so I can explain this to you. I need to have your attention. He says, you do it by focusing on the blessed hope. What is the blessed hope? The blessed hope is a term for the rapture. The rapture. You see, you might have never thought that actually being rapture-minded is an incredibly good thing to your Christian walk. You see, when we are rapture-minded, 
Something changes in our walk, in our lifestyle. Take a look at this, if you would, please. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. Rapture minded is one of the best things you and I can do and be. You see, the Bible calls it the blessed hope. Someone might be sitting here watching this morning and go, oh, there they go again with the scare tactic. Well, in all honesty, it's only scary if you are not ready. Because when that comes, I cease to take back medication. Hallelujah. My blown out knee, my carpal tunnel, my next problems that make my hands numb, all these things, I get a brand new body in Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. I go from glory to glory, from paradise to paradise. When the rapture happens. But you see, here's the thing. I don't mean to necessarily scare, but I do don't mind scaring, hear me clearly, I'm not swearing, the hell out of you. Because when that time comes, he will come for his church and he will know his own. And that is why Paul says, hey guys, you want to know how to live godly lives, lives of purpose? By being focused on that blessed hope. Because when your mind is on that blessed hope, you know and believe that Jesus could return at any moment. You see, when you and I are looking for that blessed hope, we are not looking for trouble. We are definitely not looking at porn. We are definitely not looking at another woman or another man. We're not looking at those things if we're looking for the blessed return of Jesus. You see, if you believe that perhaps today He will return with a shout, our lives will be changed. We will have meaning and purpose in every day because this is a day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad. I will use this day to share with one of those persons the truth that will set them free. How cool would it be that if you're sitting there and you're praying with somebody right there at Kapilani Park and boom, which you all jumped, by the way, a bunch of scaredy girls. <laughs> and you're praying with that last one and boom. And then you're like, as you're, you're like, woo, you're going up together with them. Yeah. You were the last one, brother. You were it right there. And we go. You see? The church is missing. We're thinking it's a legalism. We're thinking, no, it's saying, Waxer, if your mind, if I'm looking this way, I can't be looking this way. The Bible says, fret not. Why? Trust in the Lord. So what do we do? Same thing. Looking for the blessed hope, but wow, she's cute. Blessed hope, but I've really had a bad day. I need a cold one. Blessed hope, you know, dot, 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 dot. I have needs. 
My needs have not been met. God has not answered my prayer. Forget God. I'm going to do things my way. You see, the enemy will begin to fill in our mind when we give him this opportunity. But you see, when we believe in an eminent return of Jesus, it changes our hearts, our lives, our attitudes. Two stories that are true that bless me. Pastor Chuck Smith, my pastor, he grew up with such a heavy understanding of the eminent return of Jesus, the rapture, that he grew up in a very, very conservative church that did not believe that you should even go into theaters. Well, he started dating a girl that he really, really liked. And she wanted to go to the movies. And so he was like... But he wanted to impress her, so he took her to the movie. And as he tells the story, to this day he doesn't even know what the movie was because he was for sure certain that God was going to come back while he was in that theater and he was going to get left behind. God, don't come in the theaters, man. I'm going to stay in here. Uh." And then another buddy of mine, Rosales, he got saved. They started telling him he was on the full opposite side. He was so excited about the rapture and believing that God wanted to call us home at any time that he was sitting in his buddy's hippie van or hippie station wagon. And as they went around a corner on a street in L.A., the car door was so junky that the door swung open. Well, Dave thought it was the rapture and he's leaning out. Here I come, Jesus! And my friend's holding his belt buckle, driving around, going, it's my car, you fool, it's my car. The door's all flapping, and he's like, here I am. Where are we today? Are we like, Lord, 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 don't come now. Don't come because that, 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 that. Or are we, Lord, anytime, here I come, Jesus. The choice is yours, amen? He calls it a blessed hope. And I want you to hear it's a blessed hope. Why am I making such a big point of this? Some of you might be saying, dude, we got it five minutes ago. Okay, if that's the case, then this. Why then is eminence so absent from the church today? Eminence, meaning at any moment, at any time. Like the video, I might not finish this sermon before he calls us. Do we really believe in that. You see, we have become so creature comfort minded, even in the church. Hey, how can we make your experience more pleasurable? Let's put in a coffee bar. Okay. Do you really think, do you really think that we would be spending thousands of dollars on bathrooms if we believed Jesus was coming tomorrow? Am I making sense? Take your Bibles and turn with me, please. Let's go to Luke chapter 12. Keep your finger in Titus and go to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, find me at verse 16, please. Jesus has much to say about this. In Luke chapter 12, verse 16, Matthew, Mark, Luke, third gospel there in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke says this, Luke 12, 16. And he told them a parable, this is Jesus, saying, The land of a certain rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? And he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store up my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool. This very night, your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who lays up his treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. You know what rich towards God is? 1,024,000 souls if we just do what he asks us to do. He says, you get blessed by me, And instead of saying, I will live simply that others might simply live, then we go, hey, I've been blessed. I guess I can get a third car. And hey, now that I got a third car, I better get a bigger house because I have to store my stuff. And heck, now I got to go to a storage place to store my stuff because I got too much stuff to put in here and so on and so forth. And really, would we live these kinds of lives if we really believed that he was coming soon? I'm not talking of being paupers on the streets. I'm saying, are we being faithful and full of faith? You're there in Luke. Go now to chapter 17. Go to chapter 17, please. Verse 26. Luke 17, verse 26. And just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it shall be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were being given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. 
It was the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Guys, please understand, looking up is a great way to look out for trouble. Amen? Amen? Looking up. For our redemption draws nigh, is near. Believing in an imminent return of Jesus Christ gives you a joy. Because when you're going like this, you say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. (laughs) You believe in his imminent return. You believe in the power of the day, in the power of the word. Last one, let me just read it for you. Look overhead if you would. 2 Timothy 4.8 says this. In the future... There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which is the Lord, the righteous judge, who will award me on that day, not only to me, but also to all who have loved, or your NIV says, longed for his appearing. You see, he wants to give us rewards because those of us who have longed for his appearing, that means that we want to be faithful and full of faith. Amen? It's not, God, how can what you just do for me today, but what can I do for the kingdom? How can I not be a kingdom seeker or excuse me, an empire builder, but a kingdom seeker. And that's what a mentor told me years ago. He said, Waxer, make sure you live your life as a kingdom seeker, not an empire builder. And I love that word of God. I love that challenge that he's given to me. Now, let's go back to Titus because the last part of that sentence is just as important as the first. So Titus chapter 2 there, verse 13, still goes on to say, not only the blessed hope, but then it says this last part that we need to spend a little time on, please. It says this, are you there? It says, the appearing of the glory. Looking for the blessed hope. The appearing of the glory of our, please note, great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Now, let me say it again. Great, what's it say? God and Savior, Christ Jesus. This verse is a very troubling verse, as along with many others, to those who try to say that the Bible never says that Jesus is God. Because the Bible here very clearly says Jesus is God. We're looking for that blessed hope. That blessed hope of what? Of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, this is a difficult verse. Now, the most popular proponents of this view that Jesus is not God are those who are involved in the fellowship of the Jehovah's Witnesses. If you're not familiar with that, the Jehovah's Witness view is that Jesus is not God. He's, in fact, only the archangel Michael, preexistent in Michael, and then the firstborn. And that is the address that they teach. Now, with this scripture and the many others in the Bible, what they have had to do once this view began to become proponed from their their own uh, recognized or being challenged by biblical Christians, they began to take their translation. And that is why if you've ever been given one, it's called the New World Translation. It is a completely different translation than the Bible that you have. Now, what I'm about to share with you, please hear me. I want your attention this way. What I'm sharing with you this morning is not to be cruel. What I'm sharing with you is not even to be right. What I'm sharing with you is that we would be effective. Amen? There are people who are struggling with truth. And they need to know that the scriptures that they have been handed in their hand is not the word of God. This version has been changed. So much so that the version that we, uh, as you guys all know, John 1.1. This version says, in the beginning, the word was with God and the word was A God, not God. Then when you come to our text today, it says, while we wait for the happy hope and glorious manifestation of the great God and of the Savior. Separation, great God and of the Savior, Christ Jesus. Now, when someone starts taking original manuscripts, meaning we have over 24,000 copies in the Greek, So we know what the text says. There's over 11,000 in the Old Testament, 24,000 in the New Testament. You have all the great translators of the world who have translated the Bible, all continue to say the same thing, but this one version. Now, when they began to change this in the 50s, what happened is that they had a sense of scholars that came together for the anointing in order to translate the scriptures properly. That is what you will be shared with from a dear meaning a well-meaning and dear Jehovah's Witness, saying, hey, the scriptures needed to be translated properly. Well, here's some insight for you today. Number one, they tried to keep it secret who these people were that actually were translators. 
So when the version first came out, they were like, who are these individuals who are able to translate the the scriptures more correctly, more accurately? They were wanting to keep it secret. When asked why, they said, well, because we want all the glory to go to God. Well, that's a very safe place to be because no one can test their credibility. Then it did come out in 1954 by one of their own. One of their own who was part of the process brought forth and they were beginning to take glory and credit amongst themselves within the movement. One of their own brought it forth. And so you can go do your homework. In 1954 in Scotland, they brought forth this council of individuals who were supposed to translate the scriptures better than has been done in the past. And in this council in 1964, they were given a first year Greek and Hebrew test, i.e. translate this one verse. And they could not do it. A typical eighth grader in any Israeli school or any Greek school would know more than what these... They were simply asked, I know how to translate. They said, Genesis chapter 1, verse 5. Please translate that. And they could not do it. You see, folks, why am I saying this? Well, there's books here, things of here. The point is this, that when the Bible says Jesus is God, it's critical that Jesus is God, and you need to know that Jesus is God. And when they want to make it say that it's not, you have to twist with the text. Amen? The Bible says what it means, and it means what it says. Now, why? Why is this so important? Well, guys, we need to know that Jesus is God. I have a pamphlet for you in the back that just says 20 reasons why Jesus is God. If you want that, if you're going to be dealing with some friends who are Jehovah's Witness or others who believe that Jesus is not God, or yourself is wondering about it, please grab that in the back. We've made those available for you. But listen, we need to know this. Why? Because it's our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is my blessed hope. Amen? So here's just a few. Let's do a little Bible study. First question, jot these down, put them somewhere in your Bible. First question I ask those who believe in this view, I ask them, who is the Savior? Who is the Savior? And now we look at the Bible. Look overhead if you would, please. I'm going to have to whip through this again. You can get copies of this from from the office. In Isaiah 43, verse 10. Isaiah 43, verse 10 says this. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servants whom I have chosen, and that you may know and believe me and understand that I am He, and before me there was no God formed. This is the Almighty. This is Jehovah they're speaking of here. And it says this. And there will be none after me. Verse 11. I, even I, am the Lord, and there is no Savior besides me. Do you see that? Okay. Another text, Hosea 13, 4. Yet I have been the Lord your God since the land of Egypt, and there were not to know any other God except me, for there is no Savior besides me. Now, we go to Titus chapter 1, verse 3, where we are. But at the proper time manifested, even in His word, the proclamation which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God our Savior, to Titus, my true child, common in the faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus. Help me out. There is no other Savior but me. There is no other Savior but me, the Lord God. And God our Savior and Christ Jesus our Savior. Look at our text right now, looking for the blessed hope, verse 13, of the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We cannot have both, guys. He's saying there is no other Savior. So if Jesus is the Savior, Jesus is? Thank you. Let's go to the next question. Who is the Alpha and the Omega? Who is the Alpha and the Omega? Look overhead, please. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8 is where we have this referenced. God the Father is speaking. He says, I am the Alpha and Omega. For you who are not familiar with that phrase, that means the beginning and the end, or the first and the last. Alpha is the first letter in the Greek. Omega is the last. And so it is an idiom, meaning the first and the last. And so God says, I am the first and the last, declares the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come. And then he says, the Almighty. I think that's pretty clear. Are you following me? Okay. Verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man. And he laid his right hand. This is John talking now. When he saw Jesus, and he laid his hand upon me saying, Do not be afraid. I am the what? First and the last. I am the living one. And notice, I was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys to death and Hades. Look this way, please. You have a wonderful time for discussion when you get to ask someone who has been struggling in this faith, you say, when was Jehovah ever dead? 
Look at you. Jehovah is all, he's eternal. Jehovah has never been dead. Well, I just showed you here in verse 8, the Alpha and the Omega. And right here in verse 17, I was dead. And now I am alive. You see, you can't have two first and you can't have two last. And then if you're thinking you need to tie this all together, then chapter 22, verse 13, Jesus then says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I think he summed it up for us. Amen. And see, the point is that Jesus received worship. Thomas came down and said, my Lord and my God. He could not do that. That would be blasphemy if this was not truly who Jesus was. Amen? Did I make my point? Okay, because the room seems kind of quiet. So I don't know whether you're trying to write things down quickly or da da Again, you can get this stuff. My point is, we need to know that Jesus is God. Because that is the confidence that you and I have that you are so amazingly loved. Notice verse 14. The great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, now says this, verse 14 of, second, of Titus chapter 2, who gave himself for us. It's not just some weekend warrior. It's not some prophet. It's not some pastor. The God of the universe gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Guys, today I want you to know that Jesus redeems us Amen? Jesus reforms us. And Jesus rewards us. God has redeemed us. God is wanting to reform us, change us, mature us. And God wants to reward us. You see, this morning it's important that every one of you here, every one of you watching at home, every one of you know that you are loved. Amen to that church? You are loved. But you're not just loved by me. You are loved by God. The omniscient, the first and the last, the almighty. And you are loved so much that this God came down in the form of a human being. And now we have Jesus Christ, God in a bod. And he lived this life to take your sin and mine on the cross. You see, you are loved by the God of the universe, the one who made it, who spoke it into existence. And the text says, gave himself. Would you underline that? He gave himself for you to save you. To forgive you. Now, I love this. Get your pencils ready for, what does it say? How many deeds? Every lawless deed. There ought to be a big hallelujah on that one. Every lawless deed. Some of you in this room, you have been deceived somewhere, somehow, because I know, because I share with people and they say, I go, man, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Oh, he might have, but I've messed mine up, man. Let me show you Titus. Looking for the blessed hope of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself that he might redeem you of every lawless deed. Now that word every in the Greek, you know what it means? Oh, you smart that? (laughs) Every lawless deed. That means he told the little white lie, or you've been slicing up cats to a pentagram in the name of Satan. Whichever side of the pendulum that you have walked, Jesus Christ's blood covers all. Amen? Amen. You see, there is power. There is power in the gospel. You see, He loves you. Now, you might be saying to the... Listen, I've not been a good person. Join the club. (laughs) Every one of us in this here, in this room, have said things that we didn't want to say, done things we didn't want to do, gone to places where we didn't want to go. Amen? Amen? But God has forgiven us. Oh, Waxer, how do you know that? Because Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates His love for us that while we were yet sinners, sinners, Christ died for us. I love that it doesn't say clean up your act and come follow Jesus. But it says follow Jesus and watch what I'll do with your act. Hey, I don't know the hurt in this room. I don't know the heartache. I don't know those of you going through a divorce, just come out of divorce. Felt like you have completely stepped aside from the ministry that God has given you. There was a time when you were rocking for God and you stepped out because of carnality and you did things that you felt has shelved you. Listen to me. There is a difference between conviction and condemnation. Conviction is of God and that is what's stirring you today and saying, hey, I have you for better things. Boyfriends, girlfriends, stop it. Stop touching one another. That is for something precious God is saying to you. 
But he says, I will also heal you and forgive you if you will cling to righteousness and godliness. And tell you what, if you're looking for the blessed hope, you're not getting naked. Amen? Amen. That would be a bad time for the rapture, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Excuse me, Lord, one moment, please. <laughs> we were doing laundry, God, we were doing laundry. No matter what, no matter where, God has a plan for your life. And the Bible says it's a wonderful plan. And today is a new day. And today you can get down on your knees when we're singing and we're worshiping. You can go up to the communion table and you say, God, thank you that you use screwballs like Moses. Notice, Moses started his life as a basket case. But I'm boom. Thank you very much. I'll be here all week. Try the veal. Basket case. But at the same time, Paul had to be lowered in a basket, scared, off the walls, killing people. David, wanting another man's wife. I could go on throughout the list. I love that the Bible shows me it's a full collection of screw-ups just like us. That God so loved the screw-ups translated the world. That He gave His only begotten Son that whoever puts their faith in Him, He will say, they will not perish, but they will have everlasting life. And that life, dear ones, begins now. My heart grieves because so many of you in this room have prayed the prayer of salvation, but you have not prayed the prayer of Lordship. Jesus, be my Lord. Your word your will, your way. Set my minds on the things above. You see, living the double-minded life, you are not finding your own life making sense. You are struggling with so many things. And Jesus says this. He said to Martha, 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 you are worried and bothered with so many things, but really only one thing matters. Only one. And Mary has chosen it. And that's just to sit at my feet. And it can't be taken from her. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, church, this morning our text says this. Look at verse 14. It says that he will purify for himself. Would you underline that? The work of cleansing us is not what I got to do for God, but it's what God's going to do in me. And there are men in this room, men and women in this room, that once they gave their life to Jesus, he began to remove from them the desire for the alcohol, the desire for this, the desire for that. You see, we begin to set our minds on the things above, believing in his eminent return and the power of the gospel. He will purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Zealous, meaning our hearts wake up and say, my day is full. I ain't got time to sin. Amen? Amen. My day is full. Rocking for Jesus. The King James, any of you guys got a King James out there? What does it say? Make for you what? A peculiar people. What are you? I'm a Christian. I'm a peculiar person. (laughs) Peculiar. Says are our versions for his own. But peculiar meaning set apart, sanctified, different, special. (laughs) You know, those dishes at home that no one ever used, then why do we have them? That you moved four times. But they're your grandmother's 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 china and even she didn't use them. (laughs) Because it'll affect the gold plating around the outside. A peculiar people. That stand out. You see, my prayer for us, church, is this. That we'll be a people who look for the blessed hope. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We will be people whose lives will be ordered fruitful, righteous, godly because we look for His blessed coming knowing that in so doing we will be blessed not only in that day but in this day as well. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Do you have that assurance? Do you have that knowledge, that understanding that Jesus Christ is God and that God came to die on a cross for your sin and mine that you might have everlasting life, assurance in this day and in the day when He calls us home? 
looking for that blessed hope. Now I'm going to ask you in this room, at this very moment in this time, do you need to make, as we say in Hawaii, pono, right with God? Do you know that you know that you know that when that trumpet comes, you will not be one of those standing here in the room looking around going, whoa, and I always thought I was going to go. Because some well-meaning guy in youth group told me that if I prayed a prayer, I was saved. And yet the Bible says very clearly that we've been looking at that weeks after weeks. You will know them by their deeds. The transformation in a life changed is a life changed. Not looking like them, but distinct, a peculiar people. And this morning, if you do not know that your name is in the book of life, and when that trumpet comes, and when that lightning crashes, and when Jesus comes suddenly like a twinkle in an eye, you do not know then this morning is a good time to get that fixed. This room is praying for you. And so if today, right here now, with every head up and every eye open, because a decision like this is so important that it's not sneaky in the dark, it's saying, here I am, Lord. And my encouragement to you is this, if you're not willing to take the stand for Jesus in a room where they're pulling for you, you won't take the stand out there where the world's coming against you. Jesus says, you confess me before men, I will confess you before the Father. And every one of us in this room that is Christian has had to come to this point in our lives. And so we're praying for you. So if today in this room, if you need to accept Jesus Christ, His forgiveness, and say, Jesus, that is for me. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life. Forgive me of my sin. Be my Lord and Savior. Because there is no one worthy, and you alone have made the way. You made me, and you saved me. And I want to come home. Forgive me of my sin. Be my Savior. If that's you, hold your hand up right now in this room. Go for it. I see you right over there. Amen. Where am I? Where else? Right over there. Amen. Right over here. Right on, buddy. Amen. Over there. Right on. Right on. Anyone else? Come on. Back there. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You who raised your hand. We're going to ask you when we do this time of prayer that you come over to the side and you put feet to that faith and you say, I raised my hand and I'm not even sure why. <laughs> Can somebody explain to me what this guy's been saying? But God is at work in you because the very last verse of this chapter says, these things, church, listen to me, these things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority and let no one disregard you. Amen. As I have done today, go thou and do likewise. Six, seven, eight people here have just said, I'm coming home, Jesus, forgive me. I want to be in that rapture count. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we come now and we pray. We say thank you, Jesus, for the power of the word. Lord, we thank you for your mathematics. That each one, reach one, Hawaii will be able to know the gospel and be transformed in our world can be transformed and truth can go to those who have fervence but they do not have truth. God forgive us because we're not willing to do for the truth what the cults are doing for a lie. They're going door to door. They're even dressing differently that they might stand out. But God, we who know the truth have been looking for coffee shops and comfortable environments and churches that aren't too cold or too hot. Lord, hell is hot. And Lord Jesus, I pray that we would believe in the imminent return of Jesus and not try to build bigger barns. But Lord God, that we would build and better our presentation of the gospel.